You're watching Harrisburg First News. Stay tuned for important information about upcoming services and events. The day of trial, betrayal, and denial. The day after the Last Supper, the day before the Sabbath. It was the day that Jesus would die. This is Friday. In the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, there would be no peace today, because this was not a day of peace, but a day of war. Humanity at war against God, and God at war against sin. This is Friday. Golgotha, the place of the skull, the cross, an instrument of death, a purple robe, a crown of thorns, a sign above the Savior's head. All hail King of the Jews, and someday they will, but not today. Today is not a day of worship, but a day of mourning. Today is the day that Jesus would die. This is Friday, but Sunday is coming. While the church office will be closed in observance of Good Friday on March 29th, we will host a Good Friday service at 2 p.m. Invite a friend and join us. It had been three long days. The echoes of the cross still filled the air. There was a darkness that was palpable. A sense of dread that was all-consuming. Fear permeated the landscape. Powered by an inconceivable loss, hope was dead. But in the distance was a sound, the sound of earth moving, of foundations rattling, the sound of God taking back the world he loved. Darkness had been flooded with light. Fear had been overtaken by hope. Death had been swallowed in victory. In that moment, sin lost its power. The grave lost its sting. And evil was left broken in defeat. He is victorious. He is triumphant. He is risen. Jesus is alive. Easter Sunday is on March 31st. Make plans to join us for one of our morning services either at 8.30 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. There will be no 6 p.m. service on Resurrection Sunday. Begin inviting unsaved loved ones to Heaven's Gates and the Hell's Flames. Tickets are available at the hospitality desk to share with family and friends. We will present the evangelistic drama on Sunday, April 7th at 6 p.m. and at 7 p.m. on Monday, April 8th and Tuesday, April 9th. If you have not already done so, you can still sign up to volunteer to help with Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. You must make a commitment from Friday, April 5th through Tuesday, April 9th. More details will be shared as we get closer to the event. We will celebrate Children's Day on Sunday, April 14th during both morning services. The theme is Ice Cream Sunday because there is something sweet about the day we come together to worship and learn more about God. Also, you will notice Kids for Christ children helping with everything from worship to ushering to serving in the sound booth. If you have not dedicated your child to the Lord, Pastor Lamer, we count it a privilege to do so. A sign of sheet is available at the hospitality desk. Hi, friends. We just wanted to let you know of a new support group starting in the church. And uh, we, uh, it would be myself and Penny Hammond. And uh, we just want to invite you, all widow and widowers, and even if you know a widow or widower on the outside of the church, to come to a kickoff uh, luncheon on April 18th at 1 o'clock. And uh, we just want to encourage you to come so that we can minister to one another and just share with one another. You can take AIM to help save the lives of unborn babies. Capital Area Pregnancy Centers, also known as Life Choices Clinic, 
will host its annual Shot at Life event on Saturday, May 4th at Central Penn Sporting Clays in Wellsville. A registration form will be included in your April bulletin, which will be available on Easter Sunday. Welcome to Harrisburg First Assembly. We're so happy to have you with us. And on behalf of the pastor, the board, and the staff, we'd like to welcome you and ask if this is your first time here visiting with us, we'd like you to take a card out of the pew in front of you and fill it out and bring it out to our hospitality desk. Thank you again for visiting us and we hope you come back again soon. Want to stay up to date on all of the happenings at Harrisburg First? Check out our monthly bulletin, our mobile app, on social media including Facebook, Instagram, and X. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on our website, harrisburgfirst.org. Well, good evening. God's good. Amen? Amen. You glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Yeah, come on. Let's stand and make our declaration to the Lord. God, I thank you for this amazing day that you've given us. We thank you for the blessings we've already uh, been partaking of throughout this day. We're determined tonight to dwell in the shelter of the Most High and rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, you're our refuge and our fortress. You're our God. We trust you. We know you'll save us from any plan the enemy might have against us today, from every deadly pestilence, and no weapon formed against us is ever going to prosper. We thank you that you cover us with your presence. We'll find safety and refuge there. Your faithfulness is our shield and our protection, so we'll not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. We understand there may be a thousand that fall at our side, 10,000 at our right hand, but in your presence those things will not come near us. We'll only observe with our eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Lord, we declare that you are a refuge. We thank you that we'll find uh, uh, protection in your presence. There no harm will overtake us and no disaster will come near our homes. I'm thankful tonight that there are angels encamped around about our home to protect us and to keep us. I thank you that when we leave there that you assign angels to lift us up in their hands so that we don't strike our feet against the stone. I'm thankful tonight that your church continues to move forward around the world and the gates of hell cannot prevail against her. We thank you, Lord, for this nation that we live in, but tonight, Lord, we stand in the gap. We pray, Lord, that when your spirit goes across this nation, that you'll not be able to say there's no one standing in a gap. I pray that tonight you'll see your people standing in the gap, repenting for the sins of this nation. I pray, Lord, that we'll turn from our ways to your ways, and God, that you'd hear from heaven, forgive, the, forgive, forgive our sins and heal this land. Tonight we pray that each of us continue to build a wall of faith around about us in the midst of chaos, confusion, and corruption. We pray for our national, state, local leaders, school boards, school administrators as you instructed us to pray for those with authority over us so we might live peaceful and quiet lives. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them. We pray against every principality and power and authority in high places that have set up, uh, set up just a uh, roadblocks, Lord, for your people, but I pray that you pull down every stronghold, that your people might not conform to the thinking of this world, but be renewed in their minds and their spirits. I pray for the nation of Israel tonight. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and God, we pray that you would move in the areas of this uh, world that need your hand upon them, Lord, people that are suffering because of the decisions of governments and individuals. I thank you that when you come in, uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, you raise up a standard against him. And God, we thank you tonight when we walk with you, we choose to walk with you. We will tread upon the lion and the cobra. We'll trample the great lion and the serpent. Because we love you tonight, your word declares that you will always rescue us. And we declare our love without reservation, with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength for you tonight. We declare that we'll love our neighbors as ourselves, and with the help of Holy Spirit, we'll learn to love one another the way that you love us. I thank you because we acknowledge your name tonight, that your protection is built up around about us. We acknowledge that Jesus is the only name by which anyone can be saved. At the name of Jesus, demons still tremble and flee. And I, we know that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I thank you that as we're your people that we have the opportunity to lift up your name in praise and worship. And I pray that we'll never lose the awe of the glory and the majesty and the power that is in that name. As we pray in the name of Jesus, we come into the presence of the Most High Almighty. Mighty God tonight, as we come into your presence tonight, 
God, you said that we should ask everything in Jesus' name. Jesus, you ask the Father and he'll give it to us. So we pray for those that have needs physically tonight. I pray for those that have needs financially and relationships tonight. That God, that you administer to them and God, draw them to you, Lord. I pray especially for those that may not know your Savior, whether online and in this house, Lord, that you draw us closer to you and God will give you the praise for it. We know that any time we call upon you, always answer us. We thank you that if there's trouble, you'll deliver us with honor and power, displaying your power and bringing honor to your name. I thank you tonight, Lord, as we've come into this house, that we realize that if we leave this place today and we go, we leave this life tonight, that if we have a relationship with you, we'll be satisfied with long life and eternity. But while we're here, we know that you'll be our help and our strength because you said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. We believe and trust your word. We know that you'll prepare a table of blessing and presence of our enemies for us tonight. And so, Father, in the midst of chaos, confusion, and corruption in the world, we come to the table of blessing confidently, not because we deserve anything, but because you prepared it and you want us to have it. So tonight, Lord, we come expecting with anticipation that you're going to move powerfully and mightily, that your spirit will move in the midst of us tonight, that you'll be glorified in everything that is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If you agree with that declaration, give him a great praise here tonight. God, we praise you. Father, we magnify your name above every name. We're ready to worship the Lord tonight. Amen? Amen. Come on, you ready to worship the Lord tonight? Amen. Come on, we need to get excited. Jesus is on the throne tonight. Amen? Yeah. Come on, let's worship him. Sing, who breaks the power? Who breaks the power?
And Lord, you have my heart. I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart. And I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice. one more time. Let's sing it like we really mean it. Lord, I give you my life. Lord, I give you my heart. Well, if you can lift your hands physically. Give you my soul. It's a sign of surrender to him. I live, I live for, for you alone. You alone. Every, Every breath, breath that I take. Every moment I'm away. Come on, sing it 
Thank you, Nina. Sing it one more time. Sing it. Lift up your voice to the Lord. I give you my heart. Give you my soul. I'll live for you. You understand that that's all that God's waiting for, for a church to say, have your way in me. But you may be seated. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm excited about what God's going to do tonight and tomorrow night. And uh, we thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us online. And uh, just a little bit, we're going to take an offering. Before we do, I want to remind you we have service tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Please encourage someone to be here. Invite someone. Um, if you don't invite them, you don't know that they won't come. And if you do invite them, you don't know that they won't come. So invite them. I encourage you to do so. And um, also reminding you that on Friday, we have a one-hour service on Good Friday, 2 to 3. We'll take communion right at 3 o'clock. And we just want to settle ourselves and remember what Jesus did on that Good Friday almost 2,000 years ago. You know, if you don't understand what Good Friday is all about, you really can't get excited about the resurrection. And so we just want to remember and uh, thank the Lord for what he's done. Invite a friend 2 o'clock and uh, to about 3 o'clock. And then Easter uh, Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we will uh, have two services, 8.30 and 10.30, no service Sunday night. We encourage you uh, to come to celebrate. Choir will be a part of the celebration as well as the dance team. We're going to have a great time and celebration. Uh, we've got something to celebrate, amen? How many know we've got something to celebrate, right? And so I need you to be praying for that as well. But I want you to be praying. We're going to ask um, everyone that can to fast and pray with us um, first and second of April. Uh, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames is going to be presented here. And if you haven't signed up and you'd like to sign up, there's no reason you shouldn't. I see Dr. Rob Starner back there who's quite the actor, so I welcome him to join us on that team. So we thank the Lord for all that he's doing. The commitment is Friday evening through um, the 5th through April the 9th, uh, Friday 7 to 9, Saturday uh, during the day 9 to 4, right after our second service until presentation at 6 o'clock, and then an hour before the pre presentation on Monday and Tuesday. Um, and if you're able to be here at 3 o'clock on Thursday, we'll, they'll be unloading the trailer, and Rusty will begin setting up the, the platform for that presentation. So keep that in mind. If you're able to be here, I'd love you to be here, but pray. Begin to invite people. Take um, invitations to your neighborhood. We're going to believe God for a harvest of souls. I believe that we live in a privileged time of the church age, and that God has given this privileged window to do all that we can for the kingdom of God. He wants to bring this harvest in. So let's you, let him use us. Let's mean what, what we just sang. Let's, th let's think about the Great Commission every breath that we take. Amen? Well, we're going to invite uh, Dr. Davis to come and just share uh, what the network is doing before we take the offering. So thank you. Make him feel at home here once again. Amen. Amen. It's another beautiful day in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, didn't see the animals lining up two by two, so it turned out pretty good. I really commend you for being here tonight. I want to highlight a few things for you that um, this church is involved in. Throw the first slide up. It would be great. Thank you, guys, in the back. Um, this is um, the Cairo Hub. And uh, the, the third session took place on 7th and 8th of March. Go to the next slide, if you would. And... Um, this started out with, um, with an idea that we really should have a strong hub in Northern Africa. And, and so we believe this is the Antioch of Northern Africa. And, and when you're in Egypt, if you accidentally say, well, it's good to have my African brothers here tonight, they just look at you. 
They don't see themselves as Africans. They're Egyptians. And, uh, and God is building his church uh, in Egypt. Go another slide, if you would. And, um, and this couple right here, uh, Pastor Terry knows who they are. Uh, they're from Belfast, Ireland. And they pastor a wonderful church there. But they're the hub trainers in Cairo. Now, I want you to understand that one day, Brian and Karen, that lovely couple there, didn't get up one day and say, I think I'm, we're going to go to Cairo uh, four times in two years. So who connected them? I did. I knew Brian and Karen, and I'd been to Northern Ireland, and I knew a distinguished leader in, in Cairo. His name is Amgad Gurgis. And I shared with Brian and Karen that we need two incredible trainers, and I believe they could be those trainers. And so when we launched that hub a year ago, March, uh, they flew over, and they've flown over again. They've flown over again, and in August, they're going to fly again at their own expense, uh, taking care of their lodging and their hotel, uh, rather airfare, round trip. They have uh, participated from the very beginning. That's what a network does. That's, not, that's what a network is. And because of faith assembly and your faithfulness and your support financially, this hub has become an incredible hub. When we were here a year ago, I was mentioning that uh, another pastor friend of mine from New York and I were going to fly uh, to Jerusalem, and then we were going through Jordan into Egypt, and we did do that. And then we went on to Ghana and then to Cape Town, uh, South Africa. And so if you ever wonder, does your giving keep giving? Does your giving make a difference? I want you to know it does in Cairo, Egypt. There's 425 pastors and leaders there, and I intentionally put a camp on it. Um, they said we could go to 1,200, and I put a camp on it. And you say, why? Because we don't want a mega hub. We want a multiplying hub because when this hub graduates, They've already picked the hub leaders in the different cities where they are going to have their own hubs. And because those hub leaders have gone through the training for two years, they'll be able to go to those other cities and on their own start their hubs. Now, the Cairo hub will continue. They'll start a new group of men and women going through it. But they're going to multiply to the other. And that's the power of compounding growth. I would rather have interest work for me than against me. <laughs> and, and I want you to know because of your generosity, uh, it's making a difference in so many places uh, in the world. Go to the next slide if you would. And um, go ahead and toggle that. Thank you. Um, Lord willing, on Thursday, uh, before the roosters get up, I'm going to get on a plane uh, here in Harrisburg, and I'm going back down to Orlando, Florida, actually Melbourne, Florida, close to where I live. And then on Friday afternoon, um, my oldest daughter, Olivia, and I are going to get on a plane, and we're headed to Durban, and then we're going to Cape Town. And this is the summit that will take place next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in Cape Town, South Africa. And because of your giving, we're able to do that. You know, I've never gotten on a plane where... Pilot said, you know, we got an incredible plane. Everything's great and beautiful. I mean, we stated the art equipment. No one bought any gas for the plane, you know, and so, sorry. You know, we got an incredible plane, but no one didn't buy anything. I didn't say the gas wasn't on its way. No, no, nobody bought the fuel. I don't care how fancy the plane is, brand new wheels and all that, if no one put any fuel in the plane. And so it takes fuel to make it go. And I want to invite you to sow tonight, and you can rest assured that God will bless it in a compounding way. I mentioned to Pastor Terry in passing today. There are leaders coming from outside South Africa, uh, the surrounding nations, there's eight of them. Anytime we host a finished summit, 
It's because, not just because of those three days. We don't see it that way. We see it as a relationship opportunity. And so we invite strategic leaders to come from the surrounding nations to be there because in the middle of the big meeting, we have a small meeting. It's called a hub leaders meeting where we begin the process of training those hub leaders. So when the hub, when the summit is over, we're launching 11 hubs in the Southern Africa region. So when you look it up online, it's not just South Africa. It's the other countries around South Africa. And so they're flying hand-picked leaders in there. And so I said to them in by an email last week, I said, if some of those leaders need help with their air travel, we're going to lean into it and we're going to help them take care of that because we want those hub leaders in the room with us as we begin to set dates for the hub launches that will take place in a few months from now. And with God's help, there's going to be 11 hubs in Southern Africa. I want you to know there's never been a hub in Southern Africa, but with God's help, there's going to be 11 of them like there is up there in Cairo. We're believing God to give us great hubs in Southern Africa. Somebody said amen. amen. And so I, tonight, I wanted you to sow generously. And my family sows every month into the Global Church Network. In addition to our tithes and offerings we give at our local church, we are generous givers, and I want to encourage you to do the same. And I'll say this, and I'll be done. I was reading an article two weeks ago about printing U.S. money here in the United States. And as I was reading the article, that it costs the same amount of money to print $1 bills as it does to print $100 bills. It takes the same amount of money, same time and energy, same number of people, to print $100 bills compared to $1 bills. And I said, isn't that interesting? I said, I want to give where it's 100 on my return and not just one on my return. I want to believe God to bless and to compoundingly bless. And I believe that when we give toward the fulfillment of the Great Commission, God says, now that's what I'm a part of. And God will bless our life. I encourage you. Let's sow generously. Thank you, Pastor Terry. We love you. Thank you, man. Dr. Davis, we're going to take an offering. And I want to encourage you to give uh, liberally. If you need to write a check out, write it out to Harrisburg First Assembly. All of tonight's offering will get to the network. And um, this church is invested in the network. Nancy and I personally are invested in the network. We believe that God is going to finish and is finishing the Great Commission. And uh, I tell people all the time, in my time in ministry, the reason that uh, I was drawn to the network is because for the first time, uh, not only were they talking about the Great Commission, they were talking about finishing the Great Commission. It's very hard to even get people talking about the Great Commission at all, let alone finishing. But I believe that this is an opportunity for us to get the job done they're going to come to take the offering. We're going to pray. If you're online, you can give on our website, hbgfirst.org. And um, you can uh, give on our mobile app as well, Harrisburg First Assembly. Very easy to give on those venues. So I want to thank you in advance. If you're thinking about maybe the Lord wants you to do something special, or one more offering uh, tomorrow night, I encourage you to just ask the Lord what he wants you to do uh, towards the network. And I can guarantee you that you are sowing uh, seed into good soil. I want to sow seed where it's going to be a return. And so this is good soil. I want to encourage you to, to consider uh, being very generous as uh, the Lord leads you. Father, I thank you for the privilege that you have given us to partner in the Great Commission. I thank you for this church. You've blessed this church. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would always uh, think foremost about the Great Commission reaching one more soul for the kingdom, realizing that it's never about us, it's about you and about those that have never heard. And so if we, we pray, Lord, as we give in this offering, we pray that we release what we have into your hands, that it might multiply, Lord, that you might use it for your honor and glory, and God, that your kingdom be expanded through the giving and faithfulness of your people. And God, I'm asking you to give it back, 
many times multiplied in Jesus' name. And Father, we'll thank you. I praise you, Lord, that you bless the giver, that they might continue to be generous givers into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord. Reagan's going to bless us with a song. Amen. I took piano lessons. I did. I told you on Sunday night, I took voice lessons, and the teacher asked me, uh, what do you plan to do? And I said, I plan to do a lot of speaking. And, and she said, do you plan to do singing? And I said, no. And she said, well, that's a good plan for your life. Uh, I, took, uh, I took piano lessons. And uh, second semester, I was up in Springfield, Missouri at Central Bible College, and, and I was uh, taking piano lessons. And working really hard at it, and uh, finally one day I was praying, and I said, uh, Lord, you know, I'm working at this, but it's so hard, and the Lord whispered, and he said, I didn't give you that gift. That was such an education, <laughs> because what's a gift isn't hard. It's a gift, and when I hear somebody play piano or, or any instrument or sing, I think, wow, what a gift God has given to them. And then when you take that gift and you work it, it gets stronger and better 
But you neglect that gift, it gets smaller, and eventually you lose it. That's what the Bible teaches. You take what he's given, you do with your best, he gives you more. You neglect it, he takes it away and gives it to somebody else. I don't want him to take it away from me and give it to somebody else. And I, I'm so grateful you're in the house of the Lord. And tomorrow night, I want to I teach on sailing the storms of life successfully. Um, you know, all of us tonight are at one of three places on the journey. We're either just getting out of a storm, or we're in a storm, or we're headed to one. And you say, that sounds morbid. You know, sometimes we don't bring the storms on ourselves. Sometimes other people bring them on us. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, our, our, our nation is headed to a storm. It is. And I didn't get up today and help make that happen. I just know it's going to happen. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but folks, just as sure as you're sitting in this auditorium, our nation is sailing to a storm. And so sometimes we didn't bring it on ourselves, so somebody else brought it to us. Sometimes, you know, we can be in the middle of it and have play a part in that storm. Sure happened to Jonah. You know, when Jonah got on that boat, they didn't know they were getting a storm. Those, those pagans got a storm because they put him on the boat. And, but we're, no matter where we are, if we come to an understanding, I believe the Lord wants to help us sail successfully through the storms of life. And I want to talk about that out of Acts 27 tomorrow night, one of the great stories in the book of Acts about the Apostle Paul and how the Lord told him how he was going to be able to take himself and everybody else through this terrible storm and make it to the other side. And so I want to encourage you to be in the service uh, tomorrow night. There's a handful of um, unhindered books left uh, there, I think four or five, maybe six, and I want to encourage you to get your copy of of it. It's in the entire book of Acts, every chapter and every verse, and I know that it will enrich your life. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word tonight? I want to start with Acts chapter uh, 12 and verse number 1. For over 40 years, I have pondered a thought that a friend of mine said to me in an Arby's restaurant in the state of Alabama when I was 19 years old. We were on a youth outing. We had been to Six Flags, and we are on our way home. And this same friend said to me, he said, Have you ever tried a Jamocha shake? I said, no, what is a Jamocha shake? He said, well, I'll get you one right now. And it was there in that Arby's. Now, by the way, if you've never had one, you know, you haven't got to Canaan yet. You just need to understand that. And, uh, and so I, I remember him getting me one and, and drinking that shake. And then we were having a conversation. And his name was Tyree. And he made this statement. He said, I wonder when I get to heaven, if I will look back across my life and wonder if I had prayed faithfully, if I had prayed more, if I had prayed in faith, would some of those prayers have been answered? I never forgot it. And I believe that God wants to help us to overcome the prisons of life. And it is done through prayer. And it's found in Acts 12, verse number 1. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some of who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews... <coughs> He proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover 
to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Now on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in the front of the gate. Then they said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for every story that you have put in so that we could read and hear it tonight. And Lord, I pray that you will teach us some lessons regarding prayer. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to overcome the prisons of this life. And Lord, I pray that you would anoint me to speak. I pray that everything that you have put into my heart, I pray, Lord, that you will deposit in every one of our hearts and multiply it until you come. And we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said... Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. For a little while, I want to talk about <clears throat> overcoming the prisons of life. You know, when, when you read through the pages of the book of Acts, it's from one triumph to another triumph. From one victory to another victory. They'll have one obstacle, one opposition, an opportunity, and an overcoming. It just, it's a cycle. And all along the way, you will find that God's people are praying. They're praying in Acts chapter 2 on when Pentecost fully came. And all the way through the book of Acts, you'll find people praying. That you will find that they really did believe that God would work on their behalf. And there are people today that are living in prisons. Not prisons built by somebody else. Prisons built by themselves. Some people live in a prison of fear and worry and dread and anxiety. It's always about what might happen. And they take God out of the equation and they forget that God plus one equals a majority. Some people live in those kind of prisons. Some live in prisons of addiction and strongholds and terrible habits. And they have lived in those prisons for years and for years. But that is not the way God wants the Christian to live. That is not the way that God wants us to live. Now, 
I don't know if any of us are able to walk on water. I'm surely not. And there's not a halo on my head, and there's not a rainbow wrapped around my shoulder. And would not all of us have feet of clay. But ladies and gentlemen, the Lord has called us to overcome the prisons of this life. And there will be obstacles that will come. There will be challenges that will come our way. There will be people that will let us down. And every once in a while, you'll find a Judas at your dining room table. But ladies and gentlemen, the Lord has called us to overcome. It is our testimony in this world that we are overcomers. Every once in a while, somebody will ask me, they'll ask me, what is my middle name? And uh, there's a handful of people that know what my middle name is. I was having a meeting briefly yesterday, and, and they were asking about my twin brother and, and me. I, I have an identical twin brother, and uh, you can get more done when you have a twin. And uh, when you have a twin, you can always blame it on somebody else, and they'll actually believe you. <laughs> and, uh, but my brother's name is James L. Mine is James O. And we're named after two different grandfathers whose first name was James. And I've shared with you some of that before, and, 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 but it doesn't stop there. Their grandfathers was named James, and my dad was named James, and my uncle's named James. My brother had a son, and I had a son that's now in heaven. And, you know, we just get fixed on one name, and we just drive it to the ground. And, uh, but my middle name is not in the dictionary. And so just yesterday, someone was asking, they said, well, what does that O stand for? And I said, overcomer. And he said, are you being serious? I said, of course not. <laughs> I said, but uh, we're just not going to talk about the O. <laughs> and, and we're not going to talk about it tonight. And, and so, but God wants us to be an overcomer. He wants us to overcome those prisons, those challenges that come our way. And I want to encourage you to write down these thoughts that I'm going to share on prayer. Because, ladies and gentlemen, every sin could be overcome through prayer. Every temptation can be overcome by prayer. Every wrong decision can be overcome by prayer. Someone has said that every failure in the Christian life can be overcome through prayer. If that's true, and it is, then you know what? I want to learn all I can on prayer because I want to be an overcomer. I want to overcome the prisons of life. First of all, we are to pray with freedom. Pray with freedom. Peter is in prison. The church is meeting in a house and they are in prayer. You know, every once in a while we hear people say, well, you know, our young people can no longer pray in school. You know that's not true, don't you? <laughs> they can pray anytime, anywhere, any place. You don't have to have a law passed in order to have freedom in prayer. Now, I'm just as bothered as you are that we will legalize some things and, and make it illegal in other things. I understand all that. I understand that what used to be right is now wrong and what was wrong is now right. That we've seared our conscience. We laugh at what we should not laugh at. We weep at what we shouldn't weep over because we have seared our conscience as a culture. But when it comes to prayer, you and I always have freedom to pray. Uh, not just when things are going bad. Don't, don't treat the Lord like a spare tire. Only take him out when you need him and throw him back in the trunk when it's over. That is not the Christian life. We are to consistently have a lifestyle in prayer. We should pray with freedom. We should exercise the opportunity that we have to pray, not just every once in a while. Have a schedule to your prayer time. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I don't have a, a morning time of prayer be, because I'm not a morning person. Well, that's probably because you stay up too late at night. If you would go to bed a little earlier, you'd get up earlier and you would pray. Uh, 
I, I, people know me who serve on our team. They know that there's going to be a time in the morning I want some quiet time. And, and sometimes it's early, sometimes it's mid-morning. But there's going to be a time when I want everything turned off, I want to be still, I want to be quiet, I want to read God's Word, and I want to pray. It's so important that we give all of it to the Lord. Sometimes we say, well, you know, some of the stuff that's on my mind, that's not really that big, and I don't want to bother the king of the universe with it. Uh, well, come up close and listen. Everything is small to God. <laughs> Nothing is big to God. So sometimes we don't bring our small things, but when in reality, all of our things are small. And the Lord invites us to come. We are to pray with freedom. Isn't it interesting that the night before Peter is to lose his life, he's sleeping. I don't know about you. Now, this is just me. Um, if I'm in a prison cell and I've got 16 guards around me, that's how many he has, 16 around him. 16 for one guy, Peter. And, and you got, you're chained to a guard on one side and one on the other and you're in a cell and the rumor is tomorrow the, the sword that got John is going to get you. And, and, you're, and Peter's sleeping. I, 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 I'm more wired than that. Um, I, I'm probably going to ask the guards beside me, what time is it? Uh, what time is sun, sunrise? Uh, but Peter is sound asleep. He, he understands that God knows where he is. You know, we used to sing the song years ago, Standing on the Promises, and that's a great song. But we can sleep on the promises also. I believe God wants us to get a good night sleep. I do. You know, we don't need to fret and worry about all the other things because God knows what's on our heart. And I realize some nights it's easier than others. I understand all that. Trust me, I do. But we need to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer. I started that many, many years ago. When I'm out for a walk, I'm whispering a prayer. If I'm walking through an airport, uh, I'm whispering a, a prayer. Uh, if I'm walking into a hotel... I'm whispering a prayer as I'm going in to the hotel, asking God to give me favor upon my life when I walk up to that counter. You say, do you really do that? I really do. Because the person on the other side is going to determine where I'm going to spend the night. And I don't want to sleep next to the elevator. I've been there, done that, don't want the elevator. I don't want to sleep by the ice maker. I've tried that. That's not going to work. I don't want to spend the night in the middle of a ball game or ball team. Been there too. I don't want to be in the middle of a wedding party on the third floor. If the wedding party is on the third floor, put me on the 15th floor if you got it. I want a quiet spot. And I believe God answers prayer. I believe he takes care of the small things and the big things. A few weeks ago, I was flying into... Um, uh, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. Plane got in late. Pastor, a friend of mine picked me up, Pastor David, and took me to the hotel. Got to the hotel about 1230 at night, and he dropped me off, and I was walking in through the front doors, and I was whispering, Lord, you know, just take care of me tonight. You've seen what kind of day it's been, and, and I pray that the guy or gal there will do their best to take care of me. And I, I walked up, and he said, uh, what's your name? And I always give my ID. And he goes, well, it's great to have you. And he said, I just want you to know, we've given you the presidential suite for tonight. And I said, no, I don't want that. I take, no, I don't want that. I, I'll just take the elevator or the ice maker. <laughs> I believe the Lord was saying, I've seen the kind of day you've had. I've seen some of the things you're walking through. 
But I sent a message a long time ago to put, that, put you in a nice place tonight. And what am I saying to you? God knows your address. He knows everything about your life. And we are to pray with freedom, believing that God hears us when we pray. And that's a good place to say amen. Oh, my friend, we ought to pray with freedom. Secondly, not only pray with freedom, we should pray with frequency. The Bible says prayer was made without ceasing. Frequency. Sometimes we pray a short prayer, so I've been done that now. Move on to something else. Frequency. You know, Jesus said, Seek me and you'll find me. Knock and the door will be open. But what Matthew was saying there was keep on knocking, keep on seeking. And you will, I will answer your prayer. God is saying in the story with, with Peter, the church kept praying. It was serious. There, there's leaders' life was in danger. They were praying without ceasing. I believe that we ought to have bulldog tenacity in our prayer. I believe we stay on the prayer until it is answered. Sometimes God will say, I'm going to do it now. Sometimes he'll say, I'm going to do it later. Sometimes he's going to be quiet, and then he's going to give you an answer later. But regardless, we stay, we stay on the prayer. We continue to pray. I encourage people all the time to pray for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. I don't say, you know, by the way, you know, if you can pray one time this year just for an hour, that'd be good. Uh, no, I, I encourage people, anytime you're involved in prayer, spend a little bit of time praying for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Should I do that every day? Of course, it's not finished yet. <laughs> we need to keep praying until the answer comes. There, there needs to be that consistency. As we develop a consistency, we develop a pattern. And if we develop a pattern, we can develop a habit. And a habit is a powerful thing. When you develop good healthy habits, you're rearranging the wiring in your brain. You're not spending your whole life in fear or flight mode or fight mode or flight mode. You're learning to rest on God's resources. You're learning to rest on his record, not just rest from working, but rest while you work. And God wants us to have that in our life frequency. Bring such a peace in our life. I'm reminded of the story about the young girl that was getting on an airplane, and, and she's about seven or eight years old, and she's sitting toward the front of the plane, and, and there's a businessman that got, got in. He was headed home, been doing a bunch of stuff, and, and he got in, got behind her, and the plane took off and, and got in the middle of some serious stormy weather, and when that plane would bounce, she'd laugh. He wasn't laughing. Uh, saw that lightning popping and plane bouncing. She's laughing. And then a little later, she starts humming. And he's thinking, well, I don't know what's wrong with that girl up there. I mean, you know, the rest of us, we're holding on for dear life. And she's just singing, humming, smiling. And finally, the plane landed. And as they were gathering their bags, he, he said, uh, Young girl, can I ask you a question? When she said, well, sure. And he said, I noticed you were humming. Then later you were laughing. And then you were singing. For me, I was concerned that we were going to make it through that storm. How did you do that? She said, well, my dad's the pilot. And my dad told me, enjoy the trip. And I'm going to tuck you in bed tonight. My dad told me we were going home together. My dad told me he was going to take care of it. So I just knew who was flying the plane. And so I was just enjoying the trip. And what am I telling you tonight? 
Enjoy the trip. Enjoy this life. Don't complain about what you don't have. Enjoy what you do have. And enjoy what God has given to us each and every day of our life. After you spend 15 minutes complaining, you know what you have? The same stuff. Don't just spend 15 minutes complaining about that. Spend time praying and asking God to divinely intervene in your life. Oh, we have to have frequency, but also we have to have fervency. Another translation says, and they prayed with fervency. Uh, uh, fervent heat. They prayed with intensity. They didn't just pray with frequency, but they prayed with fervency. They, their whole heart was in it. You, you know when somebody's whole heart is in something. If somebody says to you, you know, when you get a chance someday, why don't you come by the house? I'd like to visit with you. But then sometimes somebody will say to you, why don't you, why don't you come by the house on Saturday? Because um, I've got some steaks I'm going to put on the grill. Why don't you come over on Saturday? We'll grill some steaks. Or I've brought them some fresh salmon, and I would love to share it with you on Saturday. Now, which one's the most serious? The one that says, when you get a chance, come by someday. Or the guy or the gal says, by the way, I've got some steaks I want to put on the grill this Saturday or some salmon I want to put on the grill and I'd like to share it with you. You know the second person, his heart is in it. That's what it means with fervency. Pray with your heart. Not just pray with your head. Pray with your heart. When was the last time in your quiet time tears were streaming down your cheeks? When was the last time as you were holding God's word and you were reading those promises and you paused and you said, God, I see that. That is for me. And thank you. And tears of gratefulness were flowing down your cheeks. They prayed with fervency. They prayed with intensity. Their hearts were on fire. The Lord's not just impressed by the arithmetic of prayer just by how many times we pray. He's not just impressed with the geometry of prayer or how long our prayer is. He wants us to pray with our heart. He wants us to pray with our emotion. He wants us to have passion behind the words that we pray. We are to pray with fervency. And I can only imagine that house church where Mary was, what was going on in that house. The, they, they'd seen the, what they'd done with one and what the plans were for Peter. And they knew that now it's come to that night before the next day. I don't think they were just sitting around saying, you know, she will hope it works out for Peter. It should be nice to see him next week. I don't think they were. I think they were praying with intensity and with fervency, asking God to divinely intervene and do a miracle because they needed a miracle right now. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to have fervency in our prayer. We're in a serious time in America. We're in a serious time in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We're in a serious time on Progress Avenue. We're, this is not a time for cotton candy prayers. Tastes good for a second, but gone. That's not what this is about. This is a serious matter. You know, we need to understand we are stronger on our knees than any other time in our lives. And they prayed with fervency. And there are times, Pastor mentioned it on for this coming Friday, that it's going to be fasting and prayer. There are times when we slow things down, we fast, we pray, we ask God to do what only He can do. And they prayed with fervency. Fourth, we need to pray with faith. We need to pray with faith. You know, it's interesting when you look at verse number five, it said they prayed without ceasing, they prayed fervency, and 
and they prayed to God. Catch that. They prayed to God. Does your prayer get to God? And guys, by the way, in the back, I know I've skipped one on purpose. Jump two slides and you'll be right there. I promise you. Keep going. Don't go. But we're going to be good. Go ahead. Keep going. I want the team to all go together. Keep toggling that back there if you would, guys. One more time. Get past that. One more time. You can do it. I promise you. It's going to work. Watch. One more time. Go ahead. There we go. Faith. Does your prayers get to God? You know, Jesus said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As it is in heaven, let it be done on earth. A prayer that starts in heaven gets to heaven. Not just a prayer that starts in earth. If we pray according to his will, the Bible says, we know that we will have our prayer answered. Jesus said that. Jesus said, if you pray according to his will, your prayer will be answered. Now, some people want to spend an hour trying to convince God that there's a different will for their life. Now, I just know that God knows more than we know. There is no, nothing that catches him by surprise. But the Bible says that when they prayed, they prayed to God. The whole church prayed to God. God heard the prayer of that little church in Jerusalem. God heard their prayer. And ladies and gentlemen, it takes faith for our prayer to get to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It takes faith. Not just presumption, not just assuming, but it takes faith. Faith is the master key that unlocks all kingdom doors. It takes faith to please God. Not just because we work hard, give a lot. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But when does faith become real faith? Because I know a lot of people who've heard a lot of promises and heard a lot of the word of God, but they don't live in faith. My friend, it's when we get up and do what we prayed about, put our foot of faith down, that God moves the heavens and the earth if necessary to give us victory in our life. I've seen it time and time again. When I pick up my first foot of faith and I'm moving in the right direction, God begins to do something that only God can do. And that church began to pray and that church interceded and they bombarded heaven with their prayer. Their prayers got to the throne of God and brought a miracle to Peter in that prison cell. It's so important that we cultivate our faith, that our faith, grow put ourselves in the right place and our faith will grow a little bit read the right things and our faith will grow a little more when we pray we're saying God I need you and I need you in so many ways in my life even I can't name them I can't number them the Bible says when they prayed they prayed in faith their prayer God to God. I believe our prayer gets higher than the light bulbs. I believe our prayers get higher than the ceilings. I believe our prayers go beyond the starry skies above. I believe our prayers touch the heart of God that moves this world. And when we come to him in prayer, there is nothing beyond the reach of God. There is nothing that God cannot do when a man or woman prays. The devil is not afraid of our choirs, and we ought to have choirs. God's not, the devil's not afraid of our musicians. We ought to have musicians. God's, the devil's not afraid when we have beautiful things to offer to the community. But I tell you what he fears the most is when a man or a woman brings those needs to God, a man or a woman on, the, on their knees with faith in their heart can move a whole nation by the marvelous name of Jesus Christ. Nothing is beyond the reach of God. And the Bible says that little church prayed. 
to God. They didn't pray to somebody else. They didn't depend upon others to take care of Peter. They prayed to God. We are to pray with faith. Next, we're to pray with fellowship. So you guys can back up. We can pray with fellowship. Because the Bible says that the church prayed to God. Fellowship. They are together in this. It's not lone range of Christianity. They're in this together. And you know how strongly I believe in the local church. I believe God is everywhere. I don't believe you can go anywhere where God is not. I believe there's only one place where God is not, and that's a place where you don't want to go. I don't believe God is in the hot halls of hell. It's called outer darkness. It's called the chains of darkness. It's the forever outside of the love and mercy and grace of God. But there's not a place where any of us can ever go where God isn't already there. You can't put an astronaut high enough. You can't put a rocket far enough where God's presence is not. God is everywhere. But I also believe that God is uniquely in the fellowship in a way that he's not everywhere else. Now don't miss what I'm about to say because it's true. God is everywhere. God is with me in an airplane going 40,000 feet, 700 miles an hour. God's presence is there. But his presence is different right here than it is up there at 40,000 feet. God is everywhere, but he's uniquely in a place where God's people gather together. The Bible says when two or three people gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He may be with you when you're 40,000 feet, But when you're in the place of fellowship, he says, and when two or three gather together, there I am in the midst of them. In the Old Testament, God was everywhere, just like he is now. He's everywhere. But he was uniquely in a place called the Holy of Holies that he wasn't every place else. He was everywhere. He was in Jordan. He was in Israel. He was in Egypt. He was in the then known world. But he was uniquely in the Holy of Holies in a way that he was not every place else. It was there in that Holy of Holies that you know that Shekinah glory of God was revealed. And, and the high priest went in one time a year. One time a year. He didn't stay very long and he left. But it was in that Holy of Holies where God would reveal himself in a way that he didn't reveal himself someplace else. Some time ago, an Israelite and a Moabite were sitting up on the hillside. And the Moabite said to the Israelite, said, what's that down there? He said, well, that's the that's a, that's a tabernacle. He said, well, what's the tabernacle? He said, well, that's, that's where God dwells. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, we have an outer court. We have an inner court. Uh, and, and, uh, and then we have the Holy of Holies. And, it, yeah, and, and it's there where God Almighty reveals himself in a way that he doesn't reveal to us up here on the mountaintop. And Moabite goes, well, I sure like to go to the tabernacle. And I like to go in the, you know, the, uh, in the inner side. And then I like to go all the way to the Holy of Holies. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you. I said, well, I know we're friends, but you could never do this. Well, why couldn't I not do this? He said, well, you're a Moabite. And he said, well, what's that to do with it? Well, you have to be an Israelite. He said, if you can be an Israelite, then you could at least start moving in that direction. He goes, well, I'd like to be born again an Israelite. And if I was born again an Israelite, then I would go to the tabernacle and I would go in the Holy Holy. No, it doesn't work that way. He said, you'd have to be born again an Israelite, but then you'd also have to be born again in the tribe of Judah. Now, if you're born again as an Israelite in the tribe of Judah, then you get a little closer into the, what you'd hope to get to, the Holy Holy. Well, I'd like to be born again then. And, I, and then I'd like to update it. I'd like to be in the tribe of Judah. And he said, so I can go in the Holy Holy. Well, you don't quite understand. It's not, it's, you're getting a little better, but not, still not quite there yet. He goes, well, what am I missing? Well, you'd have to be born in the tribe of Judah, but then you'd have to be a priest in the tribe of Judah. Oh, he says, so I had to be born again, had to be a priest, had to be in the tribe. Of, okay, I want to be born again. I want to be a tribe of Judah. And I want to be a priest because I want to go where God is. I want to go where God is not like he is here. I, I want the best. I don't want some of it. I want 
all of him in my life. Well, no, you don't understand. You're getting a little closer, but you'd have to be born again in Israelite. You'd have to be in the tribe of Judah. You'd have to be a priest, but you'd have to be a high priest. And if you were the high priest, then you could go in to the Holy Holies. Okay, then I, I tell you what, I want to be born again. I want to be in the tribe of Judah. I want to not just be a priest. I want to be a high priest because I want to go in the Holy Holies and I want to go in the Holy Holies every day. No, you're getting a little closer, but you're not quite there yet. You need to be born again in Israelite. You need to be in the tribe of Judah. You need to be a great high priest, but you can only go in one time a year. Now, what is Friday all about? Why is Good Friday good? Why is this Friday good? Yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. But it's more than that. The veil was rent in two. And you know what? You can go in to the Holy of Holies and you're not an Israelite. You're not, a, you're not in the tribe of Judah. You're not in just a, a priest or a high priest because what Christ did on Calvary, you can go into the Holy of Holies and you can enjoy the glory of God every day of your life. Of your life. So what is the fellowship? What is this church? It is a symbol of what it means to come in to the holy of holies. That's how important this fellowship is. When two or three gather together, there I'll be in the midst of them. That church, that, that little house that Mary had, whoo, if you had walked in there, you would have sensed the glory of God in that place. And God was moving on their behalf. We are to pray with our fellowship. We are to pray six with focus. With focus. They prayed for Peter. They didn't pray for the city of Jerusalem that night. They weren't just praying for the nation of Israel. They were praying for Peter. They were focused. I wear contact lenses. I have a very strong prescription. And if you wear glasses, you'll understand what I'm about to say. My prescription is 8.3. I know, she said, oh my. Well, there's an advantage to that. On a sunshiny day, you can take your glasses outside and you refract the light and melt steel. Uh, but when you bring focus, it's powerful. What is the Lord saying through this story? They brought focus. Everyone in that prayer meeting were focused on the same person. They were praying for Peter. I believe God answers specified prayers. Sometimes we pray, Lord, save the lost. We should, but we ought to call him by name. Sometimes we say, God, please heal our city, but call our leaders by name. Sometimes we pray, Lord, give so-and-so a safe trip. Well, look up the flight number and pray for the flight number. God, give Delta 147 an incredible trip. And may the pilots on board do their very best. Pray with specificity if we need prayer and answer prayer and healing be very specific about it if there's a financial need be very specific about it be so specific that you can write it down and then when God answers it you look at it and go wow God answered my prayer I have a friend of mine he's been at this church Dr. Elmer Towns Dr. Elmer Towns has kept a prayer journal for over 50 years. Over 50 years. And I've seen the prayer journal. And going through the prayer journal, he'll say, I prayed this prayer on such, such day, James. And God answered it on such, such day. Uh, uh, God, I prayed this prayer on such, such day. And here, God answered this prayer on such, such day. It builds your confidence in prayer. It builds your faith in prayer. And not only that, it makes you want to pray more. It, 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 focus is powerful. 
We are to pray with a focus. But last, we are to pray with a force, with a force. We are to pray believing for amazing outcomes. This house church is praying. They're praying for Peter. Peter is sleeping on the promises. And an angel wakes him up. And he says, get up. And as he's telling him to get up, those chains fall off. No matter what chains you have, God can break them in your life. He can break every fetter and every stronghold in your life. He can give you the freedom and the victory that is found in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, he got up, those chains fell off. They, the angel told him to get dressed. And then he said, follow me. And they began to get up and they began to, he begins to follow the angel. They make their way past one set of guards. They come to one set of doors. That door opens. They keep on walking. They come to a, uh, an outside iron gate and that door just swings open and he walks right out there into the street and then the angel is gone. Peter makes his way to the church house, the house where they're praying. And he starts knocking on the door. And Rhoda comes to the door and hears his voice. And she just lets him keep knocking. And he goes back in. They say to her, as you know, you're insane, Rhoda. I'm sorry, you, you just have had too much bad food, something wrong. And, and she stays after them. And finally, Peter comes in. It was easier for Peter to get out of jail than he was to get into church. <laughs> and not only that, Peter kept knocking. They had to let him in. There's some things God expects you to do. There's some people who say, well, I'm praying that God will help me to lose some weight. Would you hand me another piece of pizza, please? Bring another piece of pizza over here. But I'm praying, God, would you help me lose some weight while I drink my 10th Coca-Cola today? There are some things God expects us to do. But there are some things that only God can do. God doesn't expect you to do what God can do. But he does expect you to do what you can do. We need to understand there's some things we can do. There's some things that God can do. And God wants to do the things that only he can do. He wants us to do the things that we can do. And when we bring the practical with the powerful, there is victory in our life. And God was teaching that. They had to let Peter in. God opened a door that Peter couldn't open. But they had to open a door that Peter could come in. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the way it is in the Christian life. There's some things we have to do, and there's some things that only God can do. And when we bring it together, there is a mighty, mighty force that takes place in our life. I don't know what your needs are tonight, but God knows. I don't know what your challenges are, but God knows. And all I know tonight on this beautiful Tuesday night, the last Tuesday night of March, and April 1st will be the National Day for the Atheists when they get together. But tonight, God knows what we our needs are. And tonight, we're going to bring them to the Lord. Would you stand with me tonight in this service? Thank you, Lord. So I to close in this sacred gathering tonight. None of us in this service tonight have, have learned everything there is about prayer. There's so much more that we could learn but it's more than just head knowledge. It's got to get a, a foot down into the heart. And it's got to become part of who we are in our life. And I don't know what the needs are tonight, as I've said, but God knows exactly what all of us are walking through. And tonight... The Lord is encouraging us to enter into a new plateau, a new level of the way we pray, to develop that, that habitual lifestyle 
of prayer. God is calling all of us to that level. Because, oh, my dear friend, there are some things we can do, but there are a lot of things only God can do. And we can't do it by ourselves. And you're here tonight, you say, James, that's me. I love Christ, Christ's own throne in my heart. But I really, I, James, I want my prayers to get to God. I, I want my prayers to get to God that would move his heart and hand in the affairs of my life. In a minute, I'm going to count the three. If you can say with integrity, that's what you want. My hand's going to be the first one that go up here tonight. If that's what you want. One, two, three. Can I see your hand, please, in this sacred gathering tonight? Sure, of course. I'm going to ask them to lead us in a chorus of prayer tonight. And when they do, no matter if you be in the back or front, I'm going to invite you to come. And this is what I want to encourage us to do tonight. Find your place to to kneel along here, and we're going to spend a little time in prayer tonight. If you want to stand, that's okay, of course. But I want to encourage us just to come. It's only 835. If you're at home, you wouldn't be in bed yet. So tonight, when they begin to lead us, I want to invite you to come and find your place right along his area tonight. Let's spend a little time in prayer, asking God to help our prayers to get to him. Would you come tonight? Lord, we love you tonight. We love you, Lord, tonight. Thank you, Master. We love you, Lord, tonight. Thank you, God. Just find that nearest aisle and join me down here tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, God. We love you, Lord, tonight. Oh, Lord, we love you, Lord, tonight. Oh, God, we, we find a little quiet spot tonight. We thank you, Lord, for caring for us. For loving us, Lord. We love you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Praise God. Praise be to you.
touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find that there is none like you. There is Yeah. 
Father, we thank you. You just with your own words begin to thank him for what he's done in your life right now. Just begin to believe God for what you've asked him for tonight. Father, we thank you tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we submit into your hands tonight. God, you said you'd exalt us in due season, Lord. We humble ourselves in your presence tonight. God, we magnify your name. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we praise your name. I want to encourage you to hear the word that the Lord spoke to you tonight. We don't ever want to rush over when God takes time to break into a service. And it's an important word that we need to simply come to him and he wants to lead you into freedom. He wants to bring you into the place that you know that you need to be. But there's this thing called submission into his hand. And submission isn't God pushing the life out of you. Submission is when you step into the big hand of God and he lifts you to places you'd never be able to get to by yourself. God's looking for submission tonight. And as we submit to him, We'll never know a freedom like submitting to God and whatever he wants to do. Aren't you glad he's here tonight? Amen. Amen. We're not going to keep anyone from praying. But I believe it's appropriate that we should praise him just with hallelujah. Can we do that? It's an international praise, so let's just give it to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
One more time, just let all Harrisburg know that he's worthy of praise tonight. Come on, lift him up. Isn't he a good God? Amen. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Praise the Lord. We're not going to stop anyone from being around the altar. They're going to lead us in something. God bless you. Tomorrow night, 7 p.m. It's the last night of these nights that we've had together. So invite someone. Encourage you to be here. And invite someone for the uh, Good Friday service, 2 p.m. Let's worship the Lord as we leave here and, and uh, get to know someone you don't know. Let's worship him.